good morning. Does everybody hear me if I uh, keep the microphone right about here? Yep. All right. All right. I, uh, a little bit about myself first. Um, I'm an internal medicine physician. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to work with me, I'm a house call doctor. I uh, prefer to take care of patients uh, who really need a large and a long focus on really how they got to where they're at. To, to what led them to needing somebody like me. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I felt comfortable finally talking about healthy aging or wellness or living well. I feel that to tackle the subject matter accurately would require a conference. You, you would need to have almost a whole weekend and lots of sessions. So I felt comfortable finally uh, talking to an audience and saying this is how I look at it as a doctor. What I've learned in over a decade of seeing patients who, I have a phrase I say internally, I, I feel that a lot of people fall through the cracks and I get to see how that happens. Um, sometimes you don't get what you need out of a 15 minute doctor visit. Things have gotten just too complicated and especially with memory impairment. So. I've got a bit of a different focus and I'm going to share with you my perspective on well, what wellness means. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting for me, I started really paying attention to that when the AARP found me and they started sending me things in the mail. I felt like I have skin in the game now, I really want to pay attention to this, alright? Now today for me is a rather big day, it's also my 20th wedding anniversary. So, I think my wife this morning, I told her I couldn't have done it without her. <laughs> All right, so I guess, you know, I wanna, I wanna slip in a few things, and, and I don't really want to try to tackle a weekend conference and give you the details. You're not gonna leave here being an expert on the DASH diet, because I'm not. Um, so it's gonna be more of a global overview, and then I wanted to make it be about a doctor's perspective, because that's the perspective I bring. A physical therapist would bring a different perspective, um, but I would argue that whatever your professional background is, you're going to bring a personal wealth of experience to the question as well. So I'm going to start with, uh, with the past, really. Um, we live in a very interesting time in the 21st century, and if we're going to talk about healthy aging, it, it, it's a weird place to start, maybe, but we're going to start with how people die. And let's look at that historically. My geriatric medicine textbook tells me that there are three transitions epidemiologically through the story of man. You could go to the beginning to 1850, and most people would die of an age that was called pestilence and famine. You had quite a lot of diseases. If, if you really wanted to live well in 1830, don't get a parasite, don't get an infection, and don't go see a doctor. That was pretty much the key at that time. So if you follow death statistics, there's an, a big change around 1850. So between 18 and 50 and 1920, my geriatric medicine textbook tells me that this is the age of receding pandemics. And with that, many of us have heard of the pandemic, the swine flu pandemic of 1918. I find it very interesting to share with you uh, the Surgeon General's recommendations at that time for living healthy and avoiding that, that infection. It was to remember the three C's, clean skin, clean clothes, clean mouth. Keep your bowels free of obstruction. Remember that fear is to be avoided, for it is known that those who are fearful will contract the contagion more readily than those not. So another year or two later, you see science start to really move through our society. And so we reach the third age, which is the age we're in now, and really is the perspective I'm gonna bring. And the third age is the age of degenerative and man-made disease. So if you're not going to die of a parasite, you're not going to die of tuberculosis, you're not going to die of all these infections, you're going to live a long time. And now the types of diseases that challenge us are different. And so to live healthy now, it's not enough to improve sanitation and keep your, your clothes clean. You can make a lot of decisions to live well. 
And there's a fourth stage, which I found very interesting. Um, if you follow the statistics, you, you know, and, and really it's death statistics, you see another drop in death rate starting about the mid-1960s. And really what's going on there is doctors and science and medicine, we figured out how to mitigate these chronic diseases, these man-made diseases we had created, and we're still getting better today. Um, it was an interesting term I saw in my, my textbook for this. It's the post... It's the uh, postponement of death from degenerative and man-made diseases. So today we mitigate, we try to make the right choices, and if you're reading any of the literature, we're talking about small differences. What should you zig, should you zag, what makes the biggest difference? Now when I close, I'm going to close today with something from the Internal Medicine News, just so that I can show you something new that you can take home today and really make a big difference. Um, and uh, it's, it, it blew me away. So we're gonna try to close the deck and build into, you know, what, how do you make the right choices? So what is healthy aging? I, I would say it's certainly not the opposite. I, you know, you can take that on a lot of ways. It's certainly not being unhealthy, and it's not dying. So to me, it's living well for as long as you can, but to preserve the quality of that time. And that would be my goal. Now, over a quarter century ago, it's really strange to me, I really got to think that 25 years ago, more than that, I graduated medical school, and a lesson that I was taught early on has not changed for me at all. I, I had the chance to go out into an underserved community, and there was a country physician who I was assigned to for about two months. And just about everything he taught me has come to pass. But one of the first, first lessons he shared with me, I think, is pertinent today. And he told me that there are two types of physicians, and only two, in this, in this idea. There's the kind of physician who will take a disease and put it into the center of a person's life, and then advise that patient to move their lives around the disease. He said it's better to be the kind of physician who always keeps their patients centered and then tries to modify their life and their choices around the person. Try to figure out how to make the disease circulate the patient instead of the other way. And I think that is the heart of my approach. And in that, I, I, I feel that, that it, see, it's interesting. If you think about the horror story, who wants to have dialysis when they've got a week to live? See, that would be the example of taking a person and rotating their problem around their journey. So I find that one of the key concepts in living well, aging well, is to keep your priorities straight and to notice if all of a sudden you're moving you or your loved one around the problem. See if there's a way to reverse that. So I guess we're going to move into some slides, but I'm not sure where they went. Wake it up. I hit quite a few buttons and then we'll see if we can handle them. Here we go. All right. So you know what? Uh, I guess on that, I bet if I move the mouse and click on it, that'll make that go away, right? All right. So just a quick definition to make sure we're not going to be confused on the concept. Healthy, to feel fit and healthy. You know, this is, we all want to be there. We want to be in tip top shape. We want to be the best that we can. I'm going to move through this pretty quick. And of course, aging is the process of growing old. I put that up because I wanted to remind myself that really what I'm talking about is how to handle the inevitable wealth. It's aging. It's growing old. We're all going to grow old. So how do we do it well? And so here is a slide that shows to, you know, helps to remind me. And, you know, it's interesting. We live a long time now. And because of that, to age well means that you're going to have to handle a lot of these degenerative conditions. So if you're advising uh, clients or loved ones or if it's you yourself, how you manage your chronic conditions is going to be the focus now. I put this slide up because it's interesting to see wherever there's red, you see a decrease in lifespan over the last uh, several years. So this is from 1987 to 2007. 
I, I, I put this up not so much to depress people who are living there, but to say it's proof to me that there's something you can do. There's choices you can make that are wrong, and there are choices you can make that are right. If there is a, a certain area. Now, I'm from Tennessee. I went to medical school there, and I have some theories about a lot of that, but, but really it's very easy to get something fried and the tea is all sweet, and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so there's something you can do. There's a lot of things you can do. All right, so I, I asked myself, you know, I mean, I'm a doctor. I'm going to tell you what I think healthy aging is, but I didn't want to slip in a philosopher. And this is a 19th century German philosopher, and, and I agree with this 100%. The most essential factor in happiness is health. Next in importance after health, the ability to maintain ourselves in independence and freedom from care. And uh, I've taken this in my mind to also say, preserve your mind. Everything I have seen through my experience tells me that I want to keep my cognition as long as possible and decide for myself for as long as possible. But if you read Schopenhauer, his big thing was spending as much time as he could thinking. So I'm sure he would agree with me. A little bit more. Um, I find, I, I'll frequently put up slides from Hippocrates because really I, I could do a lot of this and just do Hippocrates books, you know. It, it, it's interesting that when you look at the history of medicine, it started with the idea of aging well, of living well, of, of approaching wellness. And, you know, I, also you got to get away from the idea there was one guy, it's about 100 years of writing, there was a lot of people. but. It's interesting, just give the right amount, not too much, not too little, of things like exercise and the right foods. It's um, nothing different today, is it? If someone wishes for good health, one must first ask oneself if he is ready to do away with the reasons for his illness. Only then is it possible to help him. So we have to take ownership. And I try to help my patients take ownership. I think a classic example is I don't smoke anymore. And then I love Gandhi. It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. So health first. And again, if you focus on your health, I believe if you focus on any aspect of health, you're doing what you can for your mind and for the longevity of it. All right. So it's interesting. You know, I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to tell you to go get the checkup. Um, a couple of interesting facts is that it's considered unnecessary. And you know what the USPSTF, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, they got a lot of press a few years back when they said not to do mammograms as frequently. They're just trying to give very dry scientific advice. But it's interesting that only 20% of recommended preventative services take place during the visit. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you uh, what those are. I'm not gonna gloss completely over the idea of what you could do as far as these issues. But let's take a look. And uh, it's interesting. You have the, the USPSTF says it's unnecessary, 20% of services are missed, and about over two thirds of us still want the checkup. I think the most powerful aspect of that is building the doctor-patient relationship. Even if everything is not done at that time, to have a relationship with someone uh, that you can trust is exquisitely important. Um, I often find that in my career, it's a lot easier if I have to give a diagnosis that's hard to hear to a patient, that it's easier for them to hear and to help them if I have a relationship instead of if I've just met them. So I'm a, a big proponent in continuing a doctor-patient relationship. And then it's helpful if you review preventative services. Um, so the CDC uh, tells us, now this is for heart health, brain health, all health. Um, lower your blood pressure. And by the way, I'm going to finish with that one. It's going to be very interesting. Um, lower your cholesterol, eat well, move your body, and don't smoke. It's interesting. Just do those things, and you can almost stop a lot of other things. You want to do everything right for today. So this is a list of 20 things which are considered uh, the top 20 preventative measures someone can take when you're going to see the doctor. Um, the idea of taking aspirin, immunizations, you know, you can see the list here. These, these are the big ones. The pneumonia shot is interesting. That's trying to prevent 
Um, when, you, when a person gets older and they get sick, their body gets weak, they could get pneumonia. We see this frequently. Well, there's a couple of, there's, there's a few strains of pneumonia that are really bad. And that's what we give the pneumonia shots for. And you may not know it, but there are two, not one pneumonia shot. Uh, those of us with children, we were taking our kids, they were getting Prevnar all the time, and then, you know, years ago. Well, we want greater than 65 to have Prevnar too now. It's been for a few years. So what will happen, you know, is you want to make sure you get your pneumonia shot. If you've only had one, talk to your doctor, you need to have the other one. All right? Um, so here's a list of a lot of things you can do to engage with the medical system and make wise choices. So, our food should be our medicine, and our medicine should be our food. You are what you eat. You make the biggest difference, you know, in that. And uh, I've loved this ever since I first saw it. <laughs> it's interesting. I love the word crap. In, in my office, I spell it with two P's, and it stands for Continuous Restrictive and Punitive Paperwork, <laughs> but, uh, which is constant flow in the doctor's office. But you eat less carbonated drinks, refined sugars, artificial sweeteners, processed foods. You need to eat more food. So eat well. Don't eat unwell. It's a, it's, you know, it's one of those things that's easy to know what to do, but hard to do. So uh, you, you've got every, look, you can get so much advice on diets. Um, and, and I don't like the idea of diet when it evokes the idea of change all of a sudden, what you eat and how you do it. To me, it's a lifestyle choice that you try to propel forward for a long time. So you can get lots of information on that. The, the American Heart Association has information, and then of course there's the DASH diet. Um, again, I, you know, if I had been asked to discuss diets, I could have easily filled an hour lecture. All right, so that's not really where I want to be. I want to gloss over some of these concepts, but what you eat is super important. And this brings us, I feel like I'm picking on the South today all of a sudden, um, on, my, on my home state. But it's interesting to, to take a look. This, this I put after diet because I know growing up there what, what's going on here. It's not so much exercise and the diet is awful. Um, I, I went to, to I did med medical school right here, you know. And I did residency in Denver. And I saw a complete difference in the patient population and the types of diseases. And I saw a huge difference when I went to the restaurant and what was offered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I find that very interesting. Um, and so what you eat, how you move your body, the choices you make influence how long you're going to live. Um, so like I'm going to tell you right now, I do, I, the more I do this, the more I connect the heart and the mind. They are connected. If you have bad heart health, the mind health is, is going to follow that. It's not going to take long usually. Um, 600,000 people die each year. Um, coronary artery disease, you, you, you know, it's just, it, but again, to me, it, it ties into the mind. So, um, a lot of dementia, Tony was talking about how 70%, you were saying 70%, um, you know, dementia patients at home, manage themselves at home. Um, so, how do we keep our minds working? We got uh, multiple studies, you know, show that you've got to keep your mind engaged. I've put slides up in the past, use it or lose it. Um, you've got to be socially engaged. Uh, you've got to use your mind. There are twin studies that verify this. Um, and so, stay intellectually engaged. A little proof. Physical activity in women. You know, I have a, a men's slide coming next. To definitely, I was putting ladies first today. Um, so it's interesting, you have 20% lower risk of cognitive impairment with those with the highest activity. So if you're not moving your body now, if your loved one or your client is not moving their body, trying to figure out how to get them to move their body will have huge benefits in many ways. Um, men, same thing, it's not going to be any different on this, gender to gender. Alright, so socialization is big. Um, this is a big question that comes to me often. When, when should I move on? Right? It's, uh, I don't want to discombobulate her by putting her into new surroundings, um, but I don't want to wait so long that, you know, they're not going to orient to the new place. And, you know, they're home alone with the TV now. They can socialize later. Finding that perfect time, it, it, there's no formula for it. It's a case-by-case -case basis, but we're always seeking that time. 
and also trying to mitigate a way to do that in home. I have had several patients who when you take them out of their home and you put them somewhere, they do great. I've had some, they become completely discombobulated. And my experience tells me it's all on the timing. It, and again, it's, I can't tell you how to judge that. There's not some algorithm I'm gonna share with you. I don't know it. It's case by case. But socialization is huge. Remain independent. So you know what, I'm getting a little personal here. Um, this is how I'm gonna look at it. I, you know, my father uh, had Alzheimer's, my grandmother. Um, I've learned quite a few things watching their journey and I know I don't want it. So I'm rather obsessed with avoiding it. So I, I'm gonna make all of my medical decisions and think about my mind before anything else. Because I know if I make a decision good for my mind, my brain health as it were, I'm gonna be making that decision for my heart and the rest of my body. But if I, I, I wanna keep that orientation so that I know when to make decisions that some might <laughs> seem strange. Uh, mobility is very important, but it's a secondary concern. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've gotten called into quite a few homes where somebody uh, is, was fine before surgery and now they're not. They can't quite read, they can't remember as well. And uh, looking, I'm gonna share with you in a minute some of what I think is going on with that. But, it, but it's enough of a real concern for me to say that I would much rather limp with my mind than stride it up. And it's not even close for me. So that brings me to a couple of concepts that you may not know. I did want to get some new information out. Um, and one of them is the idea of anesthesia. Shit yeah. papers. All right. So, you know, a recent case, you know, study, I, I saw a woman just this week who had a bad hip. She you know, was, was happy in her home, she read every day, and then she had her hip replaced. And a few weeks after, her mind never really came back. There's a very real incidence of recoverable, reversible confusion after surgery and anesthesia, and sometimes people don't recover. Now, she never did recover. And so she has no pain when she walks, but she's progressed. Now, I have some opinions on that, and uh, unfortunately, I can't, I can't, there's not a lot of studies on this, because what's up here is last year you had your first real attempt in the literature to look at all of the studies and ask the question, what studies have been done about this anesthesia question? What is the risk? Now, most of your studies are looking at it like this. Um, like you're 40, or 50, maybe you have some surgeries when you're in your 30s. Does that translate to you at 80 developing dementia? No. Unequivocally, there is no evidence that that's the case. And so the party line has to be um, that anesthesia has not been proven to cause dementia. In the literature, though, there's some interesting uh, suggestions that if you have a lot of it at very high dose, you could develop dementia later. And what what and so there's going to be more studies looking into this. But what I believe is going on is this: I think they're using a yardstick to measure this thing when they should use a ruler. Because I believe that if a person, let's say they have MCI, mild cognitive impairment, they're, they're telling a few stories over and over again, and maybe they're forgetting some things, and you just want to hurry up and get that knee fixed. I believe that to take that person and let them go through this ordeal of surgery really risks their brain, whether it be from anesthesia or not. I am starting to believe in the idea of a frail brain, that when a person starts to lose their memory, that you should baby that brain the rest of the time you have that person. You should be super careful about the choices you make. And I, I envision a future where routine surgery could involve many mental status testing first to see if perhaps a person with an unknown cognitive impairment should consult with an anesthesiologist about spinal blocks instead of general anesthesia. There's a lot of choices one can make. But you don't have to just go with the flow and just get anesthesia and not ask questions. And so my, my belief now and my practice habit is to tell a person when I think that they have a fragile brain, when I'm hearing stories that make the function of their brain suspect, that they really ought to avoid anesthesia if they can. And they should avoid uh, long surgeries if at all possible as well. 
that to really weigh out why you're doing what you're doing. And if it's just to get rid of a, a limp, I'm telling you, the people who have terrible knee pain but keep their minds sure look a lot happier than the ones striding about not knowing who they are. So that's a big habit of my practice. And I share that with you to talk about this. I would not just go forward and just get surgery without asking some hard questions if there's any question of the mind. And that would be my advice on that. Um, and uh, here's the idea of post-operative cognitive dysfunction. Um, that's the actual term for it. There's a 10 to 15% incidence uh, when testing is performed uh, three months after. Now, you know, I can remember my, my father who did ultimately die of, of probably Alzheimer's. And I can remember 15 years before, the, before he did ultimately pass of that, that he went and got his knee replaced. And um, post-op, he was hallucinating for a couple of days. He was like found him out of bed, crawling around, really strange stuff, and then he snapped back and he was fine. But go about four or five years later, he got sick, had to have some other surgeries, and then after that, he never really came back. And it's a story and a theme I've seen quite often. I look back on the first experience, and it's predictive. It's even, I've read some of the literature that discusses this too, where if you see a person who has a whole lot of confusion post-op, you really need to rethink that surgery years later because there's some predictive power in how crazy a person acts after anesthesia and surgery. That could be worse and have a more permanent effect next time. Literature's still looking and I can't, I don't wanna be on you know, record saying anesthesia has been proven to cause it. Something's going on, it could be the stress of surgery, maybe it's not the anesthesia, I tend to believe it is, and science is looking. This is uh, this, and uh, it, it rather blew me away. Um, I, I, I would imagine there's a lot of people in this audience that understand dementia. And uh, for me, I, I oftentimes say to myself, the big four, there's Alzheimer's, vascular, frontotemporal, and Lewy body. And then there's always other. Now, what's interesting is, um, this study, it's the SPRINT study, for the mind, and I believe it stands for systolic pressure intervention. You know, there's a, the, you go to the doctor, you get your blood pressure, top number, bottom number. This is just looking at the top number. We're not even talking about the bottom number. So the question was this. If you take people who, you randomize, if you're 130s, 140s, they didn't try to medicate you first. The treatment arm was medicating people down to 120 and then following them up. Now, this changes my mind on some things. Um, because there were two things noticed. The group that was treated down to 120, and this is with generic drugs, $4 at Walmart drugs. This is not fancy expensive stuff. There was a 19% a reduction in development of mild cognitive impairment in three, four years. And this, what really caught my attention though, is how many times if, if you ever thought about somebody you're looking to get their MRI back, and for me, I look and there's nothing exact, it doesn't really have the kind of shrinkage you would expect from Alzheimer's, but then they have these findings they talk about, white matter changes. You know, all this white matter change deep in the brain, it's not specific. In this study, those that were treated to less than 120 had 44% less new development of white matter changes. So this is the first study I've seen that suggested at the same time a impairment of the mind's function along with this non-specific finding that drives doctors and neurologists nuts, the white matter changes. So something's going on. So this, cha this changed my practice. I am going to push people's blood pressure down a lot more aggressively now than I used to. I used to say, well, you know, 130, 140, we'll just uh, keep an eye on that. But I'm gonna feel guilty if I'm seeing a 60-year-old patient in the office and we're 142, and I let them talk me out of the blood pressure medicine because they hit me on their bathroom all the time. I'm gonna really push back hard now because I've already shared with you my opinion on the mind. I think you have to fight for your mind and then your mobility, but they're very important both. And so for me, I wanted to share that with you. Um, we are starting to figure out how to postpone mortality from this condition. We're trying to figure out even better how to postpone development of the symptoms if we can. So knowing that 
there's measurable differences in the brain based on this, I'm gonna be very interested when the rest of the results come out of the study, but they have let us know that now. So, let's see what we got. All right, I guess, you know, I, I couldn't do everything. I wanted to give you a little bit of my own take on it, which is, again, to say, um, I think we need to be more aggressive about people's mental health as, as doctors and as advisors. And uh, make sure you put that first and mobility second, and then the management of your medical diseases, I think, after that. And uh, I would answer any questions if anybody has them. I assume, do I have question and answer time? Or am I, oh, yeah. Right. I get a question and answer time if anybody's curious. Sure. Okay, the guy who comes in who's 60 who has 142 blood pressure, would you, since you're all kind of, seems to be all about lifestyle changes, would mm -hmm. you try that first instead of saying, here, take some medication? Yes, I find that um, to, uh, it's a little carrot and stick approach that I have. I like to say, yes, I like what you're saying. If you can change your life and your pressure goes down with it, that's, that's the best choice. But you need to come back and we need to check this. We need to see what's really happening. And uh, I would also encourage that person, uh, and I would hope that if their spouse is there, I'd have a better chance of it working. Uh, but I would say, why don't you try to check your blood pressure regularly? And, that, and that's not just at the giant when there's not a line. Uh, you know, that's... Uh, we go get a device and keep up with it. See what your pressure is at different times of the day. Write it down, bring it to your doctor and say, here doc, this is what it looks like. I can use that information to choose the right medicine at the right time to tell you to take it. But I like to say, go ahead, change your lifestyle, but then come back and then let's talk about this next. But yeah, I, I would. I think I would get, in an ideal situation, if I get that person to drop some weight, start moving their body, maybe you come down to 132 and I still put them on the blood thinner, um, it's a win for the team all the way around. So any chance I have to threaten a medicine with a smile on my face to get a person to do the lifestyle changes, I do. I take it every time. Uh, sure. Um, early diagnosis of um, like MCI or you know the, all the dementia coming down with the height. Mm -hmm. I worry about that because of long-term care insurance. But is there a medical? Oh, like if you if somebody said you have like a mild cognitive impairment or early demeaning illness, right. unspecified yeah, maybe, how does that help you with insurance? Yeah, but is it medically advisable to do that if you feel that there's steps you can take to delay it? Hmm. It, it's interesting that you ask it that way in the insurance concept, uh, mm -hmm. Mary. Uh, I, for me, you know, I, I, I would say, yeah, I have the same concerns. Uh, it's, it's interesting though is, uh, I had a lawyer one time, you know, I was man, I'm embarrassed, I forgot her name, but she had me on an access television show and she looked at the camera and she said, I want you to call me before him. Because when he writes down dementia and MCI, I got in trouble. So you call me, we settle the legal, then you call him. And so I know legal's for real. Now as far as insurance, um, I'm just aware every time I put down any diagnosis now that I might be creating a situation like that mm -hmm. so I am aware I'm, I'm hesitant sometimes to put it in the code box as it were but yeah I, I have the same concern but I think you I think it is worth knowing and I would really be interested um, in a study that did something like uh, checking people with either an MMSC or a DCAT a month before surgery a month after six months and a year after and I bet something like that would show you that somebody who scores perfect is going to be fine in a year, but somebody who doesn't want them. That's what I think that would show. So I think there is utility in knowing that. I think in the future we'll use that information to avoid making people worse. Because it, it, statistically, 5% of the people age 65 in our society will have a dominion illness, but 20% at the age of 82. 